Well, hello. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about the triple challenges of food, climate, and social change. So, I'm not going to give you a, an inspirational talk about how you can succeed as an individual in today's society, but I do hope that my talk inspires you, as an individual, to work with others to change society so that we can all succeed. How many of you grow your own food? How many of you belong to a CSA? Shop at a farmer's market? Right. Have a community garden? Participate in a community garden? Great. Over the last 10 or 15 years, very exciting new ways of growing, selling, cooking, and sharing food have been breaking through the asphalt, literally, all across the United States. And we've been spreading new ways of helping to improve food security, nutrition, incomes, even conserve energy and build climate resilience. And there's a lot more really good, nutritious, delicious food out there. So there's a lot of very inspiring innovations in our food system that gives those of us who want to change the food system a lot of hope. But if we really want to see changes in our food system, we need to ask, if all of these innovations are so great, why isn't everybody doing them? And if we care as much about people and the planet as we do about the food we eat, we also need to ask why, in the richest, most productive country in the world, are 50 million people still food insecure? And we need to ask, why do underserved communities, immigrants and communities of color, food workers and farm workers still suffer disproportionately from diet-related diseases and food insecurity? And why is the global system still the largest single contributor to greenhouse gas emissions? And then, of course, what can we do about it? So I'm going to address these questions by sharing a personal story from Central America, where I worked for many years. So some time ago, I became involved with the Campesino Campesino Network. And it's a farmers-led movement for sustainable agriculture. And they're called Campesino Campesino because it means farmer to farmer. And they started it in the 1970s with farmers who had been run over by the Green Revolution. And by that I mean they'd taken out credit to buy new hybrid seeds, fertilizers and pesticides developed by the scientists at the International Agricultural Research Institutions. And they were recommended by technicians and their, from their ministries of agriculture. They received credit on the condition that they stop planting their traditional corn, beans, and squash together as polycultures and plant only corn as a monoculture. Well, their yields went up for a few years, but the hybrid varieties weren't resistant to local pests, nor were they resilient to drought or flood. And they produced, while they produced more in good years than traditional varieties, they produced less in bad years. Growing only corn and fertilizing with chemicals soon destroyed the organic matter in the farmer's fragile tropical soils, leading to soil degradation and erosion. This made them even more vulnerable to drought. Yields dropped. Farmers were encouraged to take out more credit and apply more fertilizers. But this only masked the problem of soil degradation. Pretty soon, their systems crashed. Neither traditional nor modern methods of agriculture worked. Some farmers cleared forests to open up new land, starting the cycle all over again. Others were forced to migrate in search of work to pay their farm debt and to earn money to feed their families. But others realized that the limiting factors to productivity was a lack of organic matter and the lack of water. And they began experimenting and found that compost and soil and water conservation restored, restored their yields. By growing a variety of intercropped, 
companion plants, cover crops, and green manures. They lowered pest damage, reduced weeds, and improved fertility. They planted trees. It was a lot of work, but it didn't put them in debt, and it paid off with a sustainable food supply. They had invented the practice of agroecology. They shared this knowledge with others, and because the practices worked so well, they spread farmer to farmer. So the farmers began holding workshops and traveled to villages across Mexico and Central America, spreading their knowledge. Their numbers grew. They said their movement walked on two legs: innovation and solidarity. It worked with two hands: production and protection. It had a heart that loved agriculture, nature, family, community, and it had eyes and a vision of the future, of sustainable food systems with campesinos in it. It spread to half a million farmers, who doubled, tripled, and even quadrupled their yields, and they restored the forests and the agrobiodiversity. That had been lost by the Green Revolution. What was extraordinary about Campesino Campesino was that it was led from below by the poorest, the marginalized, and the exploited, by those most negatively impacted by the Green Revolution, by those who had the biggest stake in sustainable agriculture, by those for whom giving up hope was not an option. You would think. That the dramatic successes of these poor farmers would have been celebrated as an inspiration, and they would have been encouraged and supported by the scientists, the technicians, and the ministries of agriculture. They weren't. They were ignored by the technicians until there were too many of them to ignore. Then they were accused of lying about their results. Finally, they were dismissed by the scientists, who refused to believe the farmers' agroecological methods were more sustainable than the green revolution techniques, because the farmers didn't have any scientific studies to prove their sustainability. Well, I was shocked by all of this, but the farmers weren't. They knew people viewed them as a problem rather than as a solution. They knew they were seen as people who couldn't make a difference. So that, therefore, the difference that they did make. Went unseen. In the dominant green revolution vision for agricultural modernization, the seeds, practices, food, innovations, culture, and livelihoods of the campesinos were invisible. Then, in 1998, Hurricane Mitch slammed into Central America. Over 10,000 people died. Three million lost their homes. Because it fell hardest on the poor and the marginalized, living on the hillsides and in the ravines and on the fragile riverbanks, it was called the Hurricane of the Poor. And while it wasn't the most powerful hurricane, because it, so much of the region had been deforested, and because Green Revolution farming practices had exposed bare soil to the deluge of rain, Mitch was the most destructive hurricane in the history of Central America. Tens of thousands of farms were destroyed, except for the farms of the Campesino Campesino movement. Their soil and water conservation, reforestation, and their agroecological farming practices gave them the resilience they needed to withstand what we now recognize as an extreme weather event induced by climate change. Many of the farmers actually. Benefited from the hurricane because they were the only ones who had any food to sell, and prices were high. After the initial relief efforts, Central American governments began talking with international development agencies about post-hurricane reconstruction. The farmers realized it made no sense to reconstruct Central American agriculture with conventional green revolution techniques. They knew it made more sense to rebuild sustainably. They also knew no one would listen to them. So they decided to carry out a study that compared the resilience of conventional to sustainable farms. The farmers formed teams to measure the impact of the hurricane on their own sustainable farms and on the neighboring conventional farms. If one farm had less erosion, fewer landslides, more topsoil, more vegetation, and fewer crop losses than its neighbor, 
it could be considered more resilient, therefore more sustainable. And because the Campesino Campesino movement stretched across Mexico and Central America, the farmers were able to compare 1,000 sustainable farms to 1,000 of their conventional neighbors. They measured farms in three countries and over 350 communities. Because of their massive data set, the farmers generated a clear, verifiable set of results. Sustainable farmers had more topsoil, less erosion, fewer landslides, more vegetation, and fewer crop losses than their neighbors. The farmers called national meetings with the ministries of agriculture and the international development agencies to present their findings and to argue for sustainable agroecological reconstruction. Everyone was impressed. The technicians and the scientists from the Green Revolution had to publicly admit that, in fact, the peasant farmers of the Campesino Campesino movement were right. Agroecological methods were more sustainable than Green Revolution techniques. We published the results in peer-reviewed scientific journals and waited to hear about the plans for Central American reconstruction. The farmers were enthusiastic. They'd proven the value of nearly two decades of hard work, and they were anxious to help the other farmers of Central America rebuild agriculture with farmer-to-farmer -farmer agroecology. But when the International Commission for Central American Reconstruction presented their report, we couldn't find any reference to Campesino a Campesino or to the Hurricane Mitch study. In fact, there was no references to sustainable agriculture or agroecology. And agriculture was barely mentioned at all. Governments and industry had decided to forget about it and instead proposed setting up a chain of sweatshops and new infrastructure facilities along the Pacific coast of Central America. Peasant farmers who had lost their crops, their homes, and their land were supposed to move out of the countryside and into the city to work in the sweatshops. Their products were to be sold on global markets. That was the plan for Central American reconstruction after Hurricane Mitch. It failed, miserably, but that's another story. Because the lesson is, it's not enough to be right. It's a very hard lesson. It's not enough to be right. It's especially not enough to be right if you're from an oppressed class of people that are systematically dismissed. Good practices and alternatives in and of themselves can't overcome the injustices from the societies in which they emerge. To advance sustainable alternatives, we need to dismantle the social injustices holding them back. In order to make sure that good alternatives become the norm, we need the political will of decision makers. And political will is either achieved through the power of money or through the power of social movements. So the farmers from Campesino Campesino joined the international food sovereignty movement. The food sovereignty movement is about democratizing the food system in favor of the poor. It's led by those who have the most at stake in transforming the food system. The food movement in the United States has many promising alternatives that could ensure national food security, climate resilience, that could conserve more water, could increase incomes, and could rebuild local food economies. If we want to make all of these things the norm, we need to build a powerful food movement anchored in social justice and led by those who are most negatively impacted by today's industrial food system. These are the people from underserved communities and communities of color that make up what we call the food justice movement. This means we have to all converge in all of this diversity, and we need to support the leadership of those who have the most at stake in transforming the food system. And we need a vision. We need a common vision of food justice. So to visualize this, I want to end my talk by having us ask ourselves, what would our food system look like if farm workers receive fair wages and decent working conditions? If food workers were food secure? 
If women were recognized and valued for producing 70% of the world's food, what would our food system look like if black lives mattered? Thank you.